Greetings viewers, Eric the Car Guy here, back again with another live show where I answer your automotive questions, and this is also an AMA, so I will be answering some of your other questions as well. A few things before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I cannot see the comments that you're posting to that YouTube video at this time. I will be taking the questions, however, from my website. There's a link in the description of the video you may be watching. That should take you directly to where you can ask questions. It's free to sign up for my website. You go ahead and post away to the uh, thread that you've been linked to, and we should be good to go. However, I will say that there's already a substantial amount of questions that have been posted. I've been doing these off of my website for a little bit now, and people have gotten, the, uh, gotten in the habit of, of getting the jump on things because they know that people that post questions early often get answered. However, towards the end of the show, I jump around and do a little bit of random stuff. Now, I will admit, I was kind of short for time today, so I didn't get a chance to preview as many questions as I often do before a show like this. So I haven't really had the opportunity to look up codes, things like that. Uh, also, uh, long questions. Uh, that's something I'm just going to try to avoid. I can't spend all my time trying to read somebody's question. Uh, try to be as detailed as possible and put it into like a paragraph. And that should be helpful because I want to try and get to as many questions as possible. If I don't get to your question today, well, I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, however, over at EricTheCarGuy.com, there is an FAQ page that contains uh, a lot of information on the most asked questions I get, hence the reason it's an FAQ. Uh, but I've written extensively on a lot of the problems that I've been asked about over the years, so even if I don't get to your question on this show, that's an excellent resource. Uh, after that, you can, uh, if you're signed up for the website, you can post the question to the regular forum over the service and repair, repair thread and uh, we should be able to help you over there. Other than that, I want to apologize in advance for butchering your names. Anybody who watching, watches this show knows that I can sometimes do that, and I just want to apologize in advance. Now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's uh, head over and start powering through the questions that were posted. And by the way, I do these every other week, uh, so the next show would be, well, in two weeks. <laughs> I can't say exactly when that's going to be, but uh, yeah, just not off the top of my head. I just know it's uh, the first week of February, somewhere in there. Uh, anyway, what I will do is, at the end of the show, I will post in the description when the next program will be, if you want to catch that, if I don't get you this time. All right, anything else? Oh yeah, also links to a lot of the things I discuss in the description after the show completes. However, you gotta give me a little bit of time to compose those links and put those in the description. So if you have questions about things, you can go there. Once this video is complete, it will be posted to the uh, forum thread where I'm taking the questions from. All right, Eric, start, stop talking, start answering questions. Plug! Hey, Eric, obviously somebody's watched the show before. Picked an easy name for you. Long time reader slash watcher all the way from New Zealand. Oh, summery New Zealand. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> the Fairmont is looking awesome. I love the sound of the motor on the dyno. I've got an E60 BMW 550i with a 4.8 V8 that seems to be pinging. No codes, no check engine light. Long-term fuel trim is something like minus 4% on one bank, plus one on the other. Short-term fuel is similar. MAF uh, reckons it's getting just over six Gs of air at idle. Brand new OEM coil packs and spark plugs. Old plugs were very light tan color, have run many bottles of fuel system and combustion cleaner through it without improvement. Uh, when it's cold, it runs absolutely perfectly, only pings when it's completely warmed up. I run 98 RON, so I, I'm assuming that's your uh, octane rating over there. It's not the same everywhere, for those of you wondering. And when it pings, it seems to be slightly down on power, and the auto transmission doesn't shift to smooth any ideas. Cheers! Okay, uh, what you're describing looks to me like something that's lean. Uh, and that would cause an upset of the mixture, particularly it looks like one side to the other. So one bank, that 4% side, may be the offending side where you could possibly have a vacuum leak. Uh, that could cause that lean condition, and also that uh, pinging you're talking about. That's where I'd be looking. And then other than that, uh, there could be a mechanical issue. And I've found this from uh, time to time, either timing related, or maybe a valve isn't sealing properly. However, you say it only does it when it warms up, so that leads me to believe that it's mixture related, not so much mechanically related, however, and, and the reason being is when you first start it up, it's actually a richer mixture, so it would compensate for something like a vacuum leak at that time, uh, and not so much a mechanical problem. So it's, it's, you know, without a check engine light, you're kinda doing a shot in the dark, but I've done a video about checking for vacuum leaks, 
If you don't feel comfortable using carburetor cleaner, which I perfectly understand, you can also use water. Uh, it may not be as easy to detect where vacuum leaks are, but it can help you find them. And ultimately, you know, if you have somebody with a smoke machine, that is awesome way to, an awesome way to find vacuum leaks uh, because uh, that smoke comes leaking out wherever that leak is. So that's where I would proceed with that. I'd be, I'd be looking for a vacuum leak that's causing a lean condition that's causing that pinging. Roy, 789, uh, what's your take on car detailing, i.e. compounding to remove scratches and swirls, polishing, polishing and waxing a car to protect it from contaminants, rust, UV, etc.? Do you think it's really worth it in the long run for protection against paint fade, clear coat failure, and vehicle rusting? Uh, thanks and keep, up the, uh, keep the awesome videos coming. Absolutely, any, any care or effort that you put into the finish of your vehicle is probably, <laughs> and I hate to say this, one of the best investments as far as resale value is concerned. It's been my experience, people mostly buy vehicles based on their appearance and not so much their mechanical <laughs> uh, uh, soundness. I'm trying to think of the word there, but yeah, people will, will buy a car with like zero maintenance record from the dealer new <laughs> that looks really good uh, and you know might have a failing transmission in it or something like that just because they like the way it looks. So I think investments in vehicle appearance are, are good investments uh, in the time and the money that you put into them. Personally, I don't do it, but uh, all of my vehicles save like one, <laughs> no, I'm two, I've, I've got my truck now but uh, all of those vehicles, I, I might wash them once a year. Um, there's only one I'm making payments on, and, and most of the rest of them are, are <sighs> let's just say, affordable vehicles, affordable transportation, let's say. So I don't really spend a whole lot of time on appearance. I, I spend a lot of time on the mechanical side of things to try to make sure that they run, because that's what I care about, and I'm not so concerned about resale value. But anybody that is, investments in appearance are things that you will see a return on at some point. Delta V, are there any tools you bought that made you enjoy being a mechanic again, uh, disregarding the lift? I know as a hobby mechanic, there are times when repairs took half a day, but after buying the right tool for the job, you're done in 20 minutes. It's a magical experience I'm sure many hobbyists and professionals alike have experienced. That's a fantastic question. Uh, well, obviously the lift. Yeah, I mean, that. in the past couple of years, that has been the thing to change things the most. Um, my air system with my compressor, I mean, big tools, yeah. But I'm trying to think of small tools that, that have had an effect like that. I really like those beta T handles that I got. Those, those were way cool. Um, as far as, I'm trying to think of something else that would be like a life altering kind of thing. And it, it's not really coming to mind. Uh, nothing that really jumps out at me anyway. Like I say, those T handles, I was surprised at how much I used those. I got those and I was just kind of like, meh. But once I started using them, I kind of really got into it. I mean, it's one tool, no you know, piecing together ratchets and extensions to get into tight places. In fact, I just did a rough cut of a video uh, very recently about one of the fixing of forward cars that came back. And it was the uh, Ford Taurus and it needed an alternator. And uh, it was a Ford Contour, I'm sorry. And I believe you call it a Mondeo over in Europe. Uh, and I could say that that alternator is a very difficult thing to get in and out, but those T-handles certainly helped a great deal. So you'll see those in the not too distant future, but uh, excuse me, it did make me rethink a few things uh, as far as how I used my tools. I, I can't say it reinvigorated my desire to do work, but you're, you're absolutely right. I, I do agree that the right tool makes all the difference. I mean, it's, it's like night and day, just, just like you described. I mean, you can spend all day doing one thing, you get the right tool and boom, it's done in a minute. And it's, it's kind of demoralizing the first time you experience it, but then after that, you're like, you, you just can't wait to run into that problem again just so that you can show off your newfound tools and skills. Jug, or Jag Bluebird SSS has a 1993 Nissan U13 Bluebird SSS Altima. Steering does not return to center after doing a U-turn, either long left or right full lock turns. Steering does not move to the left or right when doing highway speeds. It only happens uh, when doing a U-turn or a sudden change of direction. I cannot do proper alignment due to this problem. I have changed the entire rack, new bushes, uh, inner tie rod and tie rod ends. The ball joints is not bad and wheel bearings is all okay. Compare the steering st uh, starting of this video and at the end you'll see the difference between steering wheel being almost center and not being center. I'm not gonna watch videos or anything like that during the show. I can't really share that with the class. 
But, um, first question I have is, is I cannot see any reason why this would cause you not to be able to align the vehicle. There's absolutely no reason for that. So I, I'm really, I don't know where that's coming from. As far as what the possible problems could be, I mean, at first I thought a rack, but you've already replaced that. However, it could be the installation of that rack or something in the installation of the other parts that you mentioned that could be at issue. It could also be there's, uh, and I, I ran into a, a weird problem on a, a Toyota once. In fact, I made a video about it, and it was actually one of the E-joints in the steering shaft that was binding and causing an issue. Uh, so you might want to check those joints, look for like a red dust around those those areas and if you do see like a red dust around a u-joint or something it's bad uh, or orange dust i should say uh, just basically a fine rusty powder around a moving part a moving suspension part is a clear indication that that part is loose or failing so i, w I would look into that uh, outside of that yeah the alignment itself and once again i can't see how uh, what you're describing is is causing an alignment issue oh lastly um, with Nissans, I believe they have the yeah, upper strut bearings. Uh, if those have gone bad, uh, they can also cause a problem. And the way you might check those is, is lift the front of the vehicle up, support it on jack stands, and uh, turn the wheel lock to lock. If you do not experience the problem then, there's no weight on it, then it could possibly be a problem with those uh, uh, upper strut bearings. So, and, and those are bearings on the top of the strut that allow it to rotate back and forth, or yeah, from side to side as you steer. Rickham, hey Eric, he has a 2011 Ford Ranger. Uh, when I rolls down the windows, power, they like skip or hop all the way down. When they go up, they're smooth, both sides. Uh, tried silicone paste on the top part, hoping it would go down, but it didn't. Uh, asked a friend and said maybe squirt some Windex down. He said uh, it might have dirt and crap in the track. Haven't tried that yet. Wanted to see what you think. I don't know about mixing the Windex with the silicone, and I'm not sure how much help Windex is going to be since it's alcohol-based, so it's designed to uh, evaporate and go away. Um, I like silicone paste on window tracks, but oftentimes you have to go all the way down. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head because, you know, on, on one hand I'm thinking it could be a problem with the tracks as, as you think it is, maybe a lack of lubrication or some kind of dirt or crud down in there that, that's causing the window to bind going up. Um, well, let's see, let's hop all the way down. So going down is the problem, not going up. It could be something loose on the window itself, but I'm like, ugh, both sides doing the exact same thing. Now I'm beginning to wonder if maybe there's an electrical issue, uh, possibly in a switch or a relay or actually with this might be a control unit somewhere that's not giving the motor the, the power that it needs to do what it needs to do properly. Given that it's a newer vehicle like that, it's probably something that could be looked at with a scan tool, but it's likely going to be a higher end scan tool that uh, can look at such things. So uh, it's, I, I guess what you could do is look for those obstructions or, or anything like that. But the fact that it's happening on both sides, you know, just so, something in the back of my head saying possible electrical problem there possible electrical problem, but rule out a mechanical first and then see where you get from there. Uh, MST3K, uh, watching machine shop videos of your engine build. I was interested in how the choice of head gasket is made. We got some of, uh, we got some of Master Yoda, Kevin Frischie's thought process behind it, as well as the features of that particular gasket in your, en in your engine painting video. Uh, were you involved in choosing the head gasket, or did you just let Master Yoda choose? Since you can't exactly look up a head gasket for a custom engine by make and model, how do you narrow down to the choice of coating, number of layers, thicknesses, and sizing? I imagine much of this just came down to Kevin's experience, but I would be interested to hear any insights on the process. Also excellent question. You guys are getting good at All right. Um, me, I'm, I'm often ignorant. More ignorant than... Uh, than some of you may think. In other words, I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. And whenever I find myself in that instance, such as building this uh, custom engine that's behind me, I consult with an expert. Kevin Frischie not only filled the bill of that expert, but I mean he taught other people how to build these engines. There really is no substitute for experience. And, and to be honest, I had no hand in the selection of those head gaskets. I left all of that in his capable hands. And he was trying something there. And that's, here's the thing. I mean, I can read up all day long on this, that, and the other thing. 
and, and I sort of touched on this in a video I did recently on ETCG1 about YouTube certified mechanics. People that uh, come in claiming they know something when in essence all they've done is like maybe read it somewhere else. They're, they're offering secondhand information as if it was their information. And that is something I personally like to avoid. Oh, excuse me, I just ate. <laughs> that is something I personally like to avoid because it's, it's, it's a slippery slope. It, you know, it's, it, just, it just accentuates your ignorance even more. So, like I said, I try to find people like Kevin if I'm looking to build a performance engine like that because Kevin's built more performance engines than I could even count. I mean, he's been building them longer than I've been alive. And I respect that experience, and I defer to his experience. And if you find yourself in a similar situation, that's exactly what I would do. I'm not saying don't do your research. I'm not saying don't try things. But when you're talking about performance engine builds, you're talking about a lot of money on the line. And the last thing you want to do is not spend that money wisely or end up doing something wrong. Because even the smallest little thing can cause an engine like that to scatter. So hence the reason I, I defer to, to the experts. Uh, same thing with my transmission, Paul Cangelosi. Same thing. Same thing with my suspension. That was uh, Jack Hindley of Maximum, Maximum Motorsports. I consulted with him on it. And this is the second generation of suspension. You haven't seen the videos on this yet. First generation of suspension on the Fairmont is basically gone. And I'm redoing it. Uh, and that, that is highlighted in my blog. Uh, that's also on my website that you can check out. I do updates on the Fairmont every month. In fact, I just finished writing an extensive uh, article about the Fairmont, how it came to be, and where it is today and where I'm going and all that kind of thing that should be coming out in the not too distant future. I'm sorting that out right now. In fact, uh, I just wrapped that up today. So <clears throat> getting back to your question though, um, look for Yoda and listen to what Yoda says and try to learn as much as you can because that experience is invaluable. You can read up and you can try new things, but it's not going to be nearly as effective, I don't think, than it is if you put it in somebody's capable hands because Kevin's made all the mistakes before. You know, well, not all of them, but he's made way more mistakes doing that stuff than I did. And as a result of that, he's learned a lot. Experience. It does matter. Uh, okay, C. Gelaterry, C. Gallat, I'm not even going to try it. Hey, Eric, I have a 2004 Volvo XC90. It has a 2.9 liter six cylinder twin turbo. The car has a coolant issue. It goes through about a quarter gallon of coolant every 200 miles. I've been monitoring it for the last uh, few months and the coolant loss is definitely related to mileage, not time. So I know that the coolant isn't just leaking out of the car. I've found no trace of coolant in the cabin, no spots on the ground, no signs of coolant anywhere in the engine compartment either. So the two things left I can think of are either the turbo or the head gasket. I have not checked for combustion gases in the coolant yet, but I don't see any signs of coolant in my oil, so I'm not really sure it's the head gasket. Also, I noticed the other day that if I leave the car idling for a long time and then go and move it, a large amount of smoke will come out the tailpipe, even if the car is already warmed up before it was idling. Do you think the coolant is leaking into the turbo? Thanks for all your help. Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> it, could be, it could be head gasket or turbo. Uh, if, if that's a water-cooled turbo, and I'm assuming it is based on your description of it, I'm not as familiar with, with, uh, tur with Volvos uh, of this vintage, so I really can't say, uh, but I wouldn't put it beyond Volvo to do something like that. Water-cooled turbo is nice because, uh, like my turbo, when I go to park somewhere, if you've been driving on the highway for, say, a long period of time and you just turn the engine off, the oil that's inside the, the bearings of the turbo, that's just going to cook. And when it does, it can just sort of turn into hard, yucky gunk and clog up and over time cause a lack of lubrication in the turbo. So that's where turbo timers come in. That's where leave it running for a little while after you've driven for a long period of time uh, in order to circulate the oil through and get that thing cooled down so that the oil does not cook inside the turbo. Now, water-cooled turbos, less of an issue because, you know, you're cooling it with water. So therefore, that is another place that can also leak. Now, whether or not that leaks directly into the turbo housing itself, I'm not sure. Because uh, I'm not familiar with, with how that system is set up, so I really can't say. Uh, as far as the combustion gases, I would check for that. It doesn't necessarily have to mix with oil if it's going into the combustion chamber. It can just as easily go straight into the combustion chamber and not into the crankcase. There's separate passages for oil and coolant. It doesn't mean, you know, it, even if, if you have a head gasket failure or something like that, it doesn't mean that it's going to show up as milky oil. But not always. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In fact, you're more apt to see that with something like an oil cooler. 
an oil cooler is <coughs> has a coolant jacket around the outside of it if that gets compromised or gets compromised someplace in an external cooler with a radiator or something like that that's where they will mix but uh, combustion leaks into the cooling system don't always do that so uh, I've got videos on this on over overheating videos and checking for leaks both in the FAQ section uh, and I talk about how to pressure test a cooling system which would be a really good start easy way to start uh, pressure testers are not that expensive. You might be able to rent one or borrow one from your local uh, auto parts store. And if you pressurize the cooling system and that pressure leaks down rather rapidly, then it's fairly certain you've got to leak somewhere. And if it is external, it should show up. If it's not, um, then you're going to have to keep looking. Uh, another thing you might do really quick as a quick check to see if you have a head gasket problem is pull the plugs. If you find a spark plug that's like super clean, that's likely the offending cylinder because anytime water gets into the combustion chamber, it turns into steam and does a really good job of cleaning things up. So anytime you've got like a, a coolant leak into a combustion chamber, the top of that piston, the spark plug, the valves and all that stuff get really, really clean. <laughs> In fact, I did a video about decarbonizing your engine with water that works on this exact same principle. So as the coolant gets into the combustion chamber, it superheats, turns it into steam, breaks up all the carbon on the inside, goes out the tailpipe. It's kind of nice that way. Not so nice that you know, it is that type of problem. So hopefully that information can help you find the source of that mystery leak. Daniel C. has written quite a paragraph. In fact, this is about the limit of, of what I'm going to read. Hey, Eric, I have a 90, 1986 Toyota pickup. I'm an Ohio resident as well, but I occasionally have issues with finding a reliable mechanic. Specifically, I have repeat, repeat problems with repairs that for me cost a lot of money, specifically a previous mechanic replaced my muffler with a non-OEM OEM model that had none of the brackets and fell off after two years and had charged me $225 and my current mechanic has replaced an oil pan gasket in late 2015 and it's leaking and it was over $400 repair and he previously had to replace the starter and gave me a broken one and told me it was my battery. I took it back and he goes, yeah, it was a starter, it was bad. And had to service my brakes after 2,000 miles and they squeak constantly after they replace pads, rotors, and calipers. And now that I've seen, I, ha I have a major issue. The truck pulls dramatically to the left when I brake at 35 miles per hour or higher. Can't feel it pull at lower speeds, but that could be I just can't feel it because of low speed. But my current mechanic says I need control arms and idler arm and that will be six hundred dollars in repairs so I got a second opinion because I don't trust a mechanic and they said no everything up front seems perfectly fine and asked me to or told me to have my brakes checked and they may not be performing properly I just don't know what to do I have the, I have I don't have the money to have something fixed that is the real problem any suggestions on how to find someone to give me a real answer, also dealer nearest me uh, sent me away after $300 service telling me rear drums need to be replaced. Well, they were also soaked in brake fluid. When my mechanic got to them, the dealer never told me. Sorry for long question, trying to make sure you have everything you need to answer. Thanks again. Okay, Daniel. I have to give you a little dose of reality here for a couple of things. First of all, you have a 1986 Toyota pickup truck, which was a fantastic vehicle when it was new. But if you're in Ohio, it's probably not the same truck it was when you got it, namely due to corrosion. So Toyota trucks were great. Corrosion was not kind to them around here. Now, you are what I would consider, and I hate to say this to you, a problem customer. And namely because you are looking for, I'm, based on what I'm reading here, it seems you're, you're looking for low-cost repairs that are quality. Those two things don't necessarily go together, and you have an older vehicle. So in other words, the way I see it here is you've handicapped yourself by having a vehicle that needs a lot of repairs, and you can't afford to repair the vehicle. So I just want you to really consider this vehicle, and if it is the right vehicle for you, it may be time to like move on. Because it sounds to me, based on everything you've listed here, that you have several issues, and I'm not surprised. It's an 86 Toyota. Now, now granted, I'm not surprised it's still running, but I'm sure it's not without its faults, and those faults may be many, and those faults may exceed the value of the vehicle. And I'm not saying you don't love it, you don't honor it and cherish it and wish you could keep it forever and ever, because that's all you can afford. But I want you to look at the overall picture here, because just in the course of your comments, 400, um, 225, you've, and then another, th uh, well, an estimate for 300, and another 600 down here. So just in that, you've exceeded what that vehicle would be worth. 
and the things that you've already had done. And I'm not saying your, your mechanic uh, may not be at fault here. Uh, and, you know, as far as the aftermarket, and this is where I'm going to. You're, you're talking about aftermarket parts, but I'm certain that even if you could find original equipment parts for that Toyota, they would be, once again, way more expensive than the truck is worth. So I'm, I'm not even going to, uh, your braking problem, it could be the suspension is loose. You know, I have seen control arms that, if the bushings are bad, will cause the wheel to move to one side during braking and then cause the vehicle to pull to one side. I've also seen calipers that are sticking, and if they stick, then usually if one caliper is sticking and the, and the vehicle pulls towards the left, let's say in your case, that right caliper is probably sticking and not operating properly. So it, it usually pulls in the direction, opposite the direction of the bad caliper. I will say that. So. There's some information there, but I seriously want you to think about this vehicle and if it's something you want to continue to invest in and have these issues with, it may not be the mechanics. There may be very little to nothing that they can do in most cases. Because you're coming to them saying, I don't have any money, but you've got a vehicle that needs thousands of dollars worth of repairs that exceeds its value. So I want you to seriously consider that. I'm not saying the mechanics are, are, are saints. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you're handicapping them when you walk through the door with that type of attitude. So think about it. All right, Jason Bird 0927. And, and by the way, I wish you luck. <clears throat> I'm getting into filmmaking and I love the quality of your videos. What kind of cameras do you use? Also, what kind of computer do you use for editing and what film editing software do you use? Awesome. I use a Canon XA20, which right now is outdated. They don't make that anymore. Uh, but they make, they make a similar model to it. Um, 60 frames a second was the reason why I got it. I'm not switching to 4K. Uh, I don't really see the need for it because this is, what, well, this is what happened when I got this camera is I had to upgrade my computer, my storage system and everything because I was going from uh, not so much standard definition because it was, uh, I was at 960 or something like that. 960 uh, was, was like the size of the frames that I was using. So the, the video file sizes weren't all that great. But the thing is, is as you step up and you probably will go to 4K doing what you're doing. But me doing videos on YouTube, uh, what I do with my high def at 60p, you've already commented on how you like it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the higher up you go in, in the, uh, the resolution, the picture, the picture quality of your equipment, the more storage you're going to need to work with, with that. Now, I use G-RAIDs uh, and I have for a while. In fact, I also use them for archiving things. I used to use Drobros, but honestly, they, they got to a point where they were starting to let me down. Hence, you know, because I would put this high definition footage on there and I did e a connection between that and my computer and it simply wasn't fast enough and, and my editing was suffering as a result. And as far as editing goes, if you do a lot of editing like I do, time is everything. So if your computer's lagging or slowing down or causing you problems and you have to spend all your time fixing your computer and your connections and trying to figure out that your Drobo is bad, that's super inefficient and, and I hate it. Um, I've used Macs since 2001. Uh, in fact, I got into editing around, th around that time, and I, at, at that time, the Macs were best for editing. Uh, so I, I started out with that in Final Cut, and I used that for several years, all the way up until 2013-ish, 2014. Uh, and then when I switched over to this new camera, uh, Final Cut was no longer being supported. I didn't want to switch to Final Cut 10, and just because it, it was a real departure from what Final Cut 7 was. Premiere, on the other hand, Adobe Premiere, which is what I decided on, was more like a lateral move. In fact, I found out the same person wrote Premiere that also wrote Final Cut uh, 7. So there was a lot of, there was an easier crossover there for me personally. And once again, I do a lot of editing. I mean, I, I do, well, let's say, you know, on average 104 shows a year uh, because I do two shows a week, well, actually three, if you want to count stuff like this. So I, I don't really have time to learn new software or things like that. I needed to hit the ground running. And so far it's been very good. Uh, but I will leave you with this, and then I'll move on to automotive questions. A camera is a device that captures light. And if you don't give a camera good light, it's not going to be able to work very well. So no matter what kind of camera you get, the lighting is everything. And 5000K is where it's at. In fact, I re-outfitted this entire shop with 5000K lights. And if you want to look, there's a dividing line, like around... I think early 2015 is when I did that, and you can kind of see in my old videos where I had to do a ton of color correction and everything because there was a mismatch between the lights that were up there and the lights that I was using under the cars. But now everything is 5000K in this shop, and the walls are white, and it works out really well. I barely have to do any color correction at all. 
So that's extremely important. So don't just think about the camera more than anything else if you're getting into filmmaking. Learn lighting. Lighting is everything. So, and, and once again, a camera is a device that captures light. If you don't feed it good light, it's not going to be able to give you good pictures. Good luck. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to move on. Yeah, we're, we're not doing too bad. See, this is the reason why I, I don't like the long questions, because sometimes it's me that's at fault for taking too much time on answering. But I, I want to try to give you all the attention that I possibly can. And now my uh, computer's taking like forever to switch over to the next page. Come on. Come on. It's like doot, doot, doot. Uh, there we go. You know, that's probably my website. Yeah, sometimes that server, man. That server just gets weird on my site. Okay, Supercar14, hey Eric, hope you're doing well. I have another question about my 2005 Hyundai Accent. Uh, okay, was driving a car hard for a long period of time, especially with frequent stops. The brake pedal slowly becomes more and more soft until I have to put the pedal all the way to the floor for the brakes to feel like they're working. Uh, parking the car and letting it sit for a few hours will make the pedal go back to normal. The fluid is full and the pedal does not sink to the floor when sitting at a stop. I don't think it's a problem with the booster since it's, I've been told that would make the pedal harder, not softer. I don't think there's air in the line since I would think that would also make the pedal harder and the air as the air would be, be compressed. But I uh, could be completely wrong since I'm terrible with brakes. I just know like, uh, I know like, I know when they don't work properly. I also have three codes that I doubt are related, but I'll list them here for good measure. P0650, P128 and PO442, thanks and stay dirty. Those codes have nothing to do with your brakes. Those are like engine type codes, um, so, but I'm just gonna focus on the brake thing here. Uh, I'm saying the brake fluid itself, I, I would change the brake fluid. It sounds like it's boiling, uh, is what it sounds like. It also could be the brake friction material. So if you're using really cheap friction material and you're braking really hard, if you're driving this thing like a race car, it was never designed to be driven like a race car, uh, then you're, what will happen is the brake fluid will heat up to a point to where it's no longer effective. And uh, that's, you know, something that could create the symptom that you're talking about. If it was a master cylinder, the pedal would slowly, slowly sink to the floor at a stoplight. Uh, you're right about the booster. It would get harder, not softer. So the booster has absolutely nothing to do with it. I think the fluid itself or the friction material is where I would go with that. Um, and also consider your driving habits. Um, and if you are driving the car hard, then I would consider upgrading the brakes to, you know, aftermarket brakes all the way around, like rotors and pads like slaughtered or drilled or whatever, uh, updated calipers. Um, and if you are going to switch from regular brake fluid to synthetic, you have to flush out absolutely every bit of that old brake fluid before you put like a synthetic brake fluid in there. They, you, you're not supposed to mix them. So uh, if that being the case, then the uh, first thing I would try is, is check, uh, check the uh, fluid or, or just change it out. And in fact, I've got a video about that somewhere. And this is about as far as I got when I was uh, <laughs> pre-reading these questions. Honda Rider 88, hey Eric, how's the uh, snow? Did you get enough powder to make a snowman? No, there's no snow outside. It's been raining for days. You know, so the snow went away a long time ago, except for when I went up to New York uh, back in December. But anyway. My question is, uh, 05 has 155 on it, has now just started making a squeaking sound when I was rocking it side to side. Check the suspension out. Wasn't sure if it was bushings or dry rotten or just need to be lubricated, uh, or could the stabilizer links need a change? The other thing is that when I take it from a light, it feels a little wobble from the front tire. Other than that, you drive that drive great, tons of new parts, and took it to Honda dealer had an alignment, four new tires, any recommendations would gladly help. Uh, okay, <clears throat> what I'm reading here, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what kind of Honda you got here. I don't, I don't really see a y, YH205. Oh, okay, so it's a YH205. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know the model designations for them. Uh, it could be any one of those things you mentioned. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking for noises and suspension parts, look for that orange dust. Uh, that's a good indication of something. Stabilizer links on Hondas. Uh, I went through that same thing on my Element. Uh, it's not just the links, uh, also the bushings would sometimes cause a noise. Um, so you, you really just, 
have somebody rock it back and forth while you're under there. I like to like feel the different suspension parts. Uh, a lot of times you can feel a squeaker vibration in a part that way. Just be extremely careful because as the vehicle's moving around, you don't want to put your hand in something that's going to get pinched while, while somebody is doing that. Uh, you can also use a stethoscope. That's something as well. I have done videos on tracking that stuff down, but, but telling you via the internet what, what is making a noise is honestly impossible for me to do. I can just point you in the direction of how. FAQ page, there's a, an entire section just on noises. And that breaks down a lot of the methods that I use to find those noises, so perhaps one of those can help you. M. Liebert, uh, Michael Liebert, Michael Lee, Bruce Lee, and Bert, like Bert Reynolds. <laughs> uh, I could be wrong here. There could be more ways to pronounce my name, my last name, but it's French, and I don't know. And I don't know French, emoji, laughing face. Hey, Eric, was wondering if you have ever heard of New England Institute, Institute of Technology. They're in Rhode Island and have an advanced automotive high performance class. Thoughts on that? Uh, other than it would be, would it be expensive? How to assume if your tech school debt would be worth the job you could land or the money you make? Uh, plus tips on how to get uh, automotive job ASAP out of tech school. Thanks in advance for any feedback. Your info is very helpful and you really do care to help teach and educate your fans. Indeed I do and thank you for recognizing that. Well, that is a fantastic question that I think I can summarize up. And to me, it sounds like you're asking, is it worth it to go to a high performance school? And uh, how do you get a job when you get out to pay for that? Uh, as far as that school, I haven't heard of it. Um, there's all kinds of online reviews. And in fact, I recently <laughs> shot a video on how to find a good tech school for ETCG1 and then realized that I'd already shot it before. So I don't know if it'll see the light of day or not. And I actually want to watch my old one to compare it to the new one to see if there's new information. But the, the breakdown is this. Uh, <coughs> what I look for, you know, if you're just going to be uh, an, an automotive technician, is ASE accreditation. Uh, in other words, like your time spent at that school, will it count towards ASE certification? In my case, I went to an 18-month program, and during those 18 months, that counted as one year towards my ASE certification. You need to show two years work experience in addition to passing those ASE tests in order to become ASE certified. Therefore, your time in school is, you know, it helps you out in that regard to where, you know, the sooner you can get certified, the more job opportunities you have as a result of that. And a lot of times it all comes, it also comes along with increased pay. So that's, that's why I recommend that. Um, as far as, you know, is one school better than the other? The thing I recommend with that is if you can, well, first of all, tour the school. And if you can, you know, maybe hang out in the parking lot afterwards and talk to some of the students and see what they have to say about their experiences there because their first hand experience will be you know, a good tell as far as how good or not good the school is. But I will say this, above all else, no matter what school you decide to go to, whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. And what I mean when I say that is, is I've gone to, well, when I was in school, there were guys that were there that obviously weren't making an effort. And you had to wonder why they even bothered showing up to school. And they blamed the school for not teaching them. Uh, I, on the other hand, did everything I could to try to make the most out of that education in every way, shape, or form possible. And I got here. I think here is pretty good, you know, and considering that was like 20, geez, almost 20, 25 years ago. Gosh, crap, I'm getting old. But anyway, the point is, is a good automotive education can take you a long way. Now, as far as the performance side of things, that you are really going to have to make your effort because I can tell you there's probably more competition there than anywhere. And I recently read, uh, I wish I'd have brought it with me, uh, I get uh, a publication from PRI, which is the performance racing industry. And I, that, that, in my opinion, is a better show than SEMA. I mean, if you're serious about performance stuff, I mean, somebody pointed out to me like this. They said uh, PRI is like SEMA without the flame job. And I, and I think that's absolutely true because the, the real racers are there. So if you can, if there's any way possible, it's in Indianapolis every year, if there's any way possible, see if you can get your, if you want to get into the performance stuff, see if you can get into PRI, which isn't open to the public, so you have to figure that out. But, you know, students, things like that, just reach out to them because there's, if, if you want to get into the performance industry, that's the place where you're going to meet the people and find out who uh, would be hiring and who could possibly hire you. In fact, 
the approach that I took is before I was even done with school, uh, I was working at a full service gas station. Uh, they also had a, a, a service arm to that, that gas station. So in other words, there, was, there were bays and mechanics working in those bays in addition to me out there pumping gas and checking oil and all that kind of stuff. That was an excellent way to introduce myself into what it would be like to work as a technician when I got out. So in other words, you know, even if you're sweeping the floors at a shop, you'll get a good idea of what happens in that shop and the dynamics within it and your work environment, your possible future work environment. And, you know, do anything you can to gain experience because, as I said earlier in the program, experience is where it's at. So that was a whole lot of information I just threw at you, and I hope it's going to be useful to you. And no matter what, I wish you good luck. All right. I'm going to do one more in order here. But I'm, I'm just going to check something real quick because I got the feeling that there are several questions. Yeah, we're up to five pages. We started with three. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm probably going to start jumping around now since, you know, I didn't preview any of these questions ahead of time anyway. And I can tell you right now, if you've written like a book, I'm probably going to skip over it. So the, the shorter, more concise your question, the more likely it is that I'll answer it. Mercedes 300 SEL. Good vehicle. Anyway, uh, he has a 1997 BMW 535i V8 engine. I'm having a hesitation on takeoff from a dead stop on full throttle, kind of like when you had your Subaru. Uh, I think the problem is electrical and not mechanical. I've changed spark plugs, oil filters, discovered that if I unplug the MAF, the hesitation goes away. I changed the MAF uh, with a used unit, but that didn't help. Uh, do you think this is a good way to diagnose a bad MAF? Problem goes away when unplugged. Is there a better way to check its operation when there are no codes showing? Other than the car pull strong. Other than that, the car pull strong. Thank you. I don't like throwing parts at a problem in order to try to see if it's good or bad. But unplugging the math sensor is. Uh, I'm not saying that could cause it to go away, but that what that does is that, that puts the computer into a uh, what's called a limp in mode. So it's a pre-programmed state. Um, the math sensor is there to measure the incoming air to the engine, and subsequently the computer matches uh, the corresponding amount of fuel to go with it. But here's the thing. Uh, MAF sensors are, are when, when I get a no-code situation and a, he, and a hesitation on a vehicle like this, and I talked about this in my Subaru videos, check for air leaks between the MAF sensor and the engine, uh, particularly on acceleration if it's that little snorkel hose. So if there's, a, if there's a hole or just a small crack in that tube, and as you accelerate, that hole opens up, it causes it to run lean. But then as it comes down, that hole closes up, and that lean goes away. So it's real important that that tube have no air leaks in it. And, and really look around, like move it, and see if it's cracked or dry rotted, or if there is something like that in there. Because something very simple like that. So, and you're doing, I'm, I'm hearing from you what I often hear from people that are doing performance diagnosis with a check engine light, you know, with no check engine light situation, and that is they assume it's electrical. When you have to remember that underneath it all, that is a mechanical, the engine is a mechanical component. And mechanical problems can also manifest and cause performance issues and not set codes. So never rule out mechanical. Also, earlier, we had a gentleman with a BMW that was having some issues, uh, possibly running lean. And in fact, going back to that, uh, you should also check, the check for those air leaks, as I just mentioned now, in addition to, say, uh, a vacuum leak. So for both of you, I'm going to recommend checking for any leaks in between the MAF sensor and the engine, and also any vacuum leaks as well, because those can cause those types of problems and not necessarily set uh, a check engine light as a result. All right, we're going to get all random from here on out. Uh, timing light. Hello, Eric. I recently had my Honda Element aligned, and it was still 2% off to the, on the right side. Do you think this is the control arm or strut causing this? Also, could you post a link uh, repairing the hood latch on a Honda Civic Accord 95 or 96? I've already posted that video. That's uh, the one for the Acura Integra. That's pretty much the same thing. Uh, as the Civic. In fact, uh, an Integra and a Civic are virtually the same vehicle. So um, if you want to see that, then watch the Integra one, and they're pretty similar. In fact, I've also done one on the Honda Element that was also be similar. So I've done plenty of hood latch <coughs> uh, videos. I'll try and post them down in the description. Hope I remember them. But anyway, uh, it's still 2% off on the right side as far as your alignment goes. I have no idea what that means. Does that mean your steering wheel is off? 
does that mean that like on the printout it was like that it could be with intolerance is is what i'm what i'm trying to get at so in other words it could be nothing you know if they aligned it then it's aligned you know if it drives straight down the road and your steering wheel straight it's aligned and and there is a, t a tolerance that is allowed and it could be plus or minus two percent so you you could be just fine um you know with what you have so I, I wouldn't i wouldn't sweat it if it's driving down the road correctly if you've got a pole or something like that after you've done an alignment, then the first thing I would check is tires. I'd rotate them around and see if the pole moves or changes or goes away, because uh, tire problems often often show up that way. And the best time to do an alignment is just after you get new tires. In fact, I, I covered that in a video that I did about alignments. Here we are again. Ooh, we're changing pages much quicker now. All right. All right, we'll get this one up here at the top of the page. Speeding Cheetah. I like easy names that I can read. <laughs> Thank you for that. I've been hearing a fairly loud grinding noise when I turn and accelerate with my 2007 Dodge Caliber. Uh, only happens when it's quite cold outside, uh, 20, degrees below, 20 degrees or below. Doesn't do it all the time when it's warmer. I did some searching online, found quite a few forum owners of various Dodge Chrysler brand vehicles reporting this same issue. I did have a local shop look at the CV axle joints, such as... Uh, and such during an oil change, they report everything looks fine. Uh, ever heard of this kind of odd issue? Thanks for all the things you do. Wish you were, wish there were a mechanic like you around the world. There are several. There are a lot of really good mechanics out there, and they're usually super busy. Good for them, fighting a good fight, so to speak. Okay, so a fairly loud grinding noise when I turn and accelerate, uh, and this is when it's cold outside. Let me think here. And it's not, I mean, this is, I don't often work on Dodges. Uh, most people know that uh, what I mostly work on are Hondas and Acuras and things like that. That's what I'm known for. That's what I was a technician of for years and years. So I don't see too many of those. Uh, but a grinding noise, turn and accelerate. The only thing I can think of is like steering stops. And what those are is like as you turn your wheel all the way to the lock. That lock isn't always necessarily something inside the power steering rack. It may be a physical something sticking off the side of the steering knuckle that comes into contact with a control arm. And this, especially older trucks and things like that, and a long time ago I was taught to basically look for these during a lube job, which, who does that anymore? And when was the last time you saw a grease fitting on a new car? I digress. Anyway, these are things called steering stops. So there's like a little piece of metal sticking off of the uh, steering knuckle, which is where your hub and your bearing and all that kind of stuff, the thing the wheel is attached to. So it's, as it turns all the way one way, that piece of metal may come into contact with the lower control arm. And when it does, and you accelerate, and that moves a little bit, what that can cause is a horrendous noise, like a really loud, like, really loud grinding noise. So what I've often done uh, every time I see these is I just take a little bit of axle grease and I put it on the, either the uh, part that protrudes out from the steering knuckle or on the control arm itself where it makes contact. And that lubrication helps quiet it down considerably. So it may be a simple problem and it may be more pronounced when it's cold, maybe because there's sometimes what I've seen on steering stops is they put a plastic cap over the end of that protrusion coming off of the steering knuckle and if it's really cold then, and, and that's designed to help keep it quiet. So if that plastic is really cold, that may be the cause of the noise. I'm not really sure, but look under there and see if you see that. And uh, if you can turn the wheel slightly off of that, uh, that noise, then I, I would be even more suspect that that could be the problem. All right, here we go. Uh, Saturn Sam, hey Eric, I have a 1995 Ford F-150 with a 300 straight six. Awesome engine, awesome truck. Uh, the problem I'm having is when I'm trying to start it, it will crank for an extended period of time before it starts. I replace the fuel filter and the fuel sending unit. The injectors are working properly. What else am I missing? Any help would be greatly appreciated. Thanks and keep up the great work. All right. When you say fuel sending unit, technically what that means is that is the thing that uh, works your fuel gauge inside the, the cab of, of the truck. So what, what I want you to try next time is rather than cranking when you first go to start it up. So when you know that you're going to have the problem, there's going to be the extended crank time. Turn the key to run 
but don't crank the engine. So in other words, turn the key all the way to the point where all the dashes, lights, and everything light up. The buzzer goes down, chime, and all that kind of stuff. But don't turn it past that to where it actually starts turning the engine over. And hold it there for like one, two, three, four seconds. Hold it there for four seconds, turn it off. Turn it back to that same location, don't crank the engine, and give it a nice four count. Do that three times. And then at the end of the third time, when you, when you go to do it the fourth time, crank the engine. If it fires right up, that's a fuel pump problem. And it's not that the fuel pump is bad. I've done a video about this. Inside a fuel pump, there is a check valve. And that check valve is there to keep a certain amount of pressure in the system after you shut the engine down. And the reason it's there is so that you can prevent extended crank times when you go to start the, the truck again. So in your case, a truck or a car. So if that check valve goes bad, that fuel pressure will bleed off really quickly or quicker than it's supposed to. It should hold for like 30 minutes. In fact, I've done a video about testing for this uh, also. Um, so uh, in other words, you, you would you know, activate the fuel pump, let it prime up, turn it off with a fuel pressure gauge on it and watch to see the pressure drop. And if it drops significantly in 30 minutes, then that's what the issue is. And that's an internal problem inside the fuel pump. But you say you replaced it. I can say that some companies, <laughs> fuel pumps are better than others. And uh, if you have replaced the fuel pump and you still have this problem, and if you verify it, like I, like I just described, then, uh, like I said, it's likely the fuel pump. And, you, and you, you can make a decision at that point. I mean, if, if you know that's what the problem is, then all you've really got to do is prime the fuel pump every time you go to start it, and you won't have that extended crank time. So in other words, the, the check valve's bad, the fuel pump's still good. So you just have to, you know, turn it to run. One, two, three, four, turn it off. Turn it to run. One, two, three, four, turn it off. Turn it to run. One, two, three, four. And then a fourth time, try and start the engine. So it's kind of a pain in the butt. However, what that does is it prevents you all the time and effort of trying to replace that fuel pump. And on a 95 F-150, ah, it's a truck. <laughs> it's probably rusty. And uh, if you do go to do it, run the tank as empty as you possibly can because those things are heavy and fuel fuel weighs six pounds uh, a gallon yeah it's about six pounds a gallon so it's pretty stinking heavy uh, so you want to uh, try to get rid of as much of that as possible if you end up replacing a fuel pump and you know some people talk about lifting the bed off to gain access you know old trucks they get rusty and uh, that's not always that's not always doable <laughs> all right moving on uh, SWR Nismo. Hey Eric, I tend to rev at about 4k RPM between shifts for quick acceleration. Red line is at 6. Am I wearing out my engine more than if I were to shift to 2500 to 3000 RPM? Is it only bad if you're hitting the red line? Or, or is it only, yeah. I plan to have my car for many miles and don't want to kill the engine. I'm very good on maintenance. 2009 Nissan Ultima 6 speed, manual 90,000 miles. Thanks, love the SER series, big Nissan fan. You know that SER? I fell in love with that car, I really did. I, I so wished it was a manual though. That, that, I probably would have told the guy that the car was junk <laughs> and kept it for myself if it was a manual. No, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, he was a veteran. I mean, he was a veteran, no freaking way. But I would have wanted to. <laughs> All right, uh, you're, you're not hurting anything. I mean, keep it keep in oil. Uh, it's like, like my Hondas, I rev the heck out of them, like my GSR, once it's warmed up. Here, here, here's the key. You know, don't do it when it's cold. In other, in other words, don't rev the heck out of it when it's cold. And you don't have to take it to the rev line, but, but know this, you're going you're gonna to start killing your fuel mileage doing that. You will have a heck of a good time doing it. But the more, you know, the less spirited you drive, the better your fuel economy is going to be. But if you're not concerned with fuel economy and you just want to have fun, rev it. But maintain it and wait till it's warmed up. That's that's what I do. You know, I'll, I'll let it warm up. So, you know, that's that's how I would handle that. I, you're, I don't think you're going to hurt anything with that engine. And Nissan makes a heck of an engine. They really do. Uh, and it's, after I got that SER, the timing chain put in that thing, you couldn't even tell it was running. It's awesome. That was a really good car. Anyway, moving on. What do you got as far as time? Ah, you know, I feel like. I don't know if it's me talking or what. I, I should actually take a tally of how many questions I actually get to answer in an hour. Uh, but we're, we're already closing in. All right. And since that's the case, I'm going to go for short questions that I can answer quickly. Uh, Drucifer. I got that one. Like that. 
Uh, what do you think about Chevy Cavaliers? Uh, what do you see commonly wrong with them? I have an 04 base model manual, and I love the 2.2 liter Ecotec engine. And uh, do you have a, a favorite car to work on? You're a great guy and a great mechanic. Thank you for helping me and so many people with their car troubles, Andrew. Dude, thank you for saying that. But I'm gonna say, I'll, I'll impart to you a little story. When, when my wife and I first met, uh, she was driving a 1996 Chevy Cavalier. And <laughs> I didn't like that car at all. And here's why. I went to go sit in it for the first time. And when I sat down in the driver's seat, the seat had worn away so much that some of the metal underneath had, had worn through. And I caught a piece of metal like right on my tailbone. In other words, <laughs> and I, there's really no other way to say this, is my initial experience with that car was it was a pain in the ass. And it was kind of like that from then on because it had just niggling little problems. I mean, the engine was great, okay? That 2.2 liter engine, like you said, was, it was a good engine. But the rest of the car, uh, the fit, the finish, and everything else about it, uh, honestly, I'm not a fan of GMs. I'll just come out and say it. Other than my truck, my 90 truck, I love that thing to death. Like, I, you were gonna have to pry that thing from my cold, dead hands. Not just because my dad gave it to me, that's reason enough. But I love that truck. I love it. So I'm not a GM hater. It's just, they're not my favorite things to work on. Favorite thing to work on? <laughs> just like 90 Civics. I mean, those things, it's like working on a tractor. First of all, barely anything goes wrong with it. If something does go wrong with it, it's like one of a handful of things, like a main relay, uh, an igniter or ignition coil, uh, oil leaks uh, at the distributor. You can, you know, usually we fix those with an O-ring or something like that. Throw a, a timing belt on it now and again, you're good to go. I mean, they run just about forever, and they're cheap to maintain. They're out there everywhere. I prefer the manuals over the automatics, uh, but simple, <laughs> just simple, reliable machines. And not, you know, like I said, there's there's like a small list of things that go wrong, and that's that. Whereas my experience with GMs, they just they just needle me to death. <laughs> <laughs> See the Montana video, the, the Pontiac Montana that I worked on. Ugh. That's, that's been typical of a lot of my GM working on experiences, but I'm going to change that with my truck. Okay, we're going to have a good time with the truck. And, you know, the LS platform, awesome. That 350 platform that's in my, my truck, also awesome. So they can make a killer engine, but as far as fit and finish and materials of the rest of the vehicle, nah. But alas, I, I feel that way about a lot of domestics. All right, we still got time for some more. Uh, yeah, we got a lot of people posting questions here, and I'm just going to keep poking around till I answer as many as I can, it's just as long as the website starts speeding up. Slow website. Of course, I'm streaming at the same time, so that could have something to do with it. Uh, Sean, that's easy enough. Uh, 2011 Cruise 1.4, I have a P2135 code, which is either a pedal position sensor or a TPS sensor. Ever ran across this? Uh, have you ever done any testing? Hope, uh, but hope it, but hopping on this weekend. Thanks. I haven't run to that, into that. I don't see too many Chevy Cruises coming to the shop, because uh, like I said, I'm mostly a Honda guy. Uh, the scan tool is, is your friend in a situation like this. If you can pull up live data, you can look at, at both of those things and, and possibly pull them up side by side. I've got an Encore scan tool and you can compare them just to see if uh, they match up. Uh, that's, that's how I would approach it. You know, if I could pull up my scan tool and look at both of them at the same time and say, ah, you're not so good. But, you know, don't straight out of the gate condemn the sensor. Uh, just take some time and look, look around at, at wires and connectors. You'd be amazed at what mice can do. <laughs> you really would. Like a mice, they just love to chew on wires. Uh, I think it's the glycol or whatever it is that, that's in the uh, insulation. But yeah, they, uh, they definitely go after that. But don't forget about connections and don't forget about the actual sensors themselves. But I, I'd pull up on a scan tool and, and do a compare, side-by-side -side comparison of both of the readouts of those things and see if they coincide. If they don't, you got one that's not, and one that is, then uh, you know where to look. Uh, I know you're live now, but there's a static issue while you're talking. Well, batteries are good in my mics and all that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, rubbing on my shirt. Yeah, probably. The mic. Sorry about that, but thanks for the heads up. Uh, could be my beard hair coming down and contact something. Sorry. But you know, I, it's either that or I, I sit there like this during the whole show. Let's see. Yeah, there is. There is a little, and I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know. Too late to fix it now. 
Uh, Woody 44x4, 4, 4 4, 2007 Acura RDX, no heat passenger side, actuator works and can move the door, full heat manual, both heater hoses are hot, and driver's side heat is hot. Uh, first thing I would recommend you do is check for air in the cooling system. That's the number one cause of that problem. And what it is, is like only half the heater core gets uh, flow through it. So uh, the first thing I would check in that situation, I've run into that before, so check for air in the cooling system. Uh, Braden, D G Braden J. Dean. Hey Eric, love the videos. Watched all the Fairmont Bill videos. Uh, maybe if I move this over here, that would solve that problem. Maybe it's a simple thing. Did that work? It totally worked. Almost. Uh, oh well. Love the videos. Watch all the Fairmont Bill videos. Anyway, uh, there is a guy selling a 1983 Datsun 280ZX Turbo in my area. Interestingly enough, the same T5 that's in your Fairmont. I'm not surprised by that at all. Paul talked about that thing being everywhere. It runs and drives nice, but stalled a bit when I first drove it. I believe this to be due to not being driven for a while. Uh, it was recently painted, uh, but has no body damage. It was a Cali car and has no rust. Would this be a good buy? Impossible for me to say. It, it really is impossible for me. to. That's a 1983, and somebody just did body work on it. So under that beautiful paint could be, you know, a... Uh, an inch thick of Bondo. It really could. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, I hear California car, I hear all that stuff, and, you know, I really couldn't say. Uh, it's a great car. Uh, my first car that I worked on as a mechanic professionally was a, what was it, 73? It was, no, it was a 72 240Z. Love that car. Love that car. That was just a fun car to drive. That's six, that straight six, phenomenal. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. And uh, a turbo 280, eh, that sounds like even more fun, but. I, I don't know. I don't know. So yeah, it's, I've got a whole section on used car buying. I would, if I were you, if it's a significant investment for you, I would have a mechanic check it out before you actually make the purchase. That would be probably your best investment because you may have a good feeling about the car, but there, it could be complete crap underneath. So uh, it's something you just have to watch out for. All right. Uh, Wally Bolly. Uh, greetings from the Netherlands. Love your channel. On the topic of water pump gaskets, to your knowledge, is there any way to make sure RTV will not leak after installation? And is there any way to test it other than installing it, filling it up, and pressure testing it? And if there's a leak after new installation, is there any way to fix that without taking it off and doing a complete reinstall? Thanks. First of all, if there's a gasket, don't use RTV. <laughs> RTV acts as a lubricant and will actually cause the gasket to move out as you torque the fasteners down and actually cause a leak. So if, if the water pump calls for using uh, sealant as a gasket, then use sealant as a gasket. But know that RTV is something that's going to need time in order to cure. So it's, it's usually, it depends on how deeply it's buried in the engine, but usually by the time you get done putting the engine back together, you're pretty good. But I can say with stuff like Honda Bond, you gotta let that stuff dry overnight before it's actually gonna be sealed. Uh, so it depends on the type of sealer. Uh, also, the sealing surfaces themselves, they need to be, you know, clean and ready to accept the new sealing surface. But as far as, like, if there is a problem after the fact, uh, you're pretty much faced with going back in there and resealing it. So if, if it has a gasket, don't use RTV, is, is what I'm saying, unless it's called for by the manufacturer. If it's called for by the manufacturer, usually, like, on some, some part of it, uh, then yes, go ahead and do it. Like, like, maybe a little corner or something like that needs a little bit. But other than that, if it's an O-ring or if it's a paper gasket, do not add RTV to it. Let the gasket do the work. Retro Weld. Hey. Hey, buddy. Enjoying the show. What are your thoughts on the Craftsman 300-piece professional tool set? I picked one up on Mega Clearance, and they seem like good tools. Douglas. Uh, Craftsman was recently purchased by Stanley. Um, so they're, they're at the helm now. I've always liked Craftsman tools. I've, I've got Craftsman tools in my box. I've been using them since way before I was a mechanic. I think my first set of tools was Craftsman tools. They changed a lot over the years, though. I will say that. And uh, I don't know. If, I don't, stuff happens. You know, stuff doesn't stay the same. But lifetime guarantee and all that stuff, I don't know what's in that 300-piece set. But I, for my home, I had a 700-piece set for my home toolbox that I bought, and, and actually I had that at my old shop that I was using as side work. I had my toolbox that I'm using in the shop now uh, at work, and then at home for side work I had, like I said, it was like a 700-piece Craftsman set, screwdrivers, wrenches, sockets, all that stuff. It wasn't complete complete, but it was pretty darn close to being complete. 
So yeah, buying you know, a set of tools like that, especially quality tools, can save you a lot of money. And if, if you're a DIY or something like that, that's probably perfect. So yeah, awesome. Uh, one more, one more. Wow, we're five after, like my clock on the wall is slow. But I said I'd do one more, so one more. George Soria, Soriel, 2001 Honda Odyssey, the gas pedal is hard to press. Uh, clean the car, cleaned and the car does not get up to speed fast enough on the road. I changed the air filter and cleaned the throttle body, not sure what to do. <clears throat> the gas pedal is hard to press. Is your floor mat jammed up underneath it? I, I, trust me, I've seen it. I've, I've seen people come in and say that my, my vehicle doesn't perform like it's supposed to. And I get into it and I go to step on the pedals and sure enough, the floor mat is all bunched up underneath the pedals and you cannot fully depress the gas pedal. Pull the carpet out, accelerates fine. So, you know, look for the simple stuff. However, I will say this, 2001 Honda Odyssey is known for transmission problems. And those transmission problems can equate to, well, it just don't go. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's a whole section on this website. In fact, I've written just about the transmission problems on that particular vehicle over at the FAQ if you want to go check it out. But seriously, check to see if you got carpet jammed up underneath there before you do that. And cleaning throttle bodies, be careful. Be very careful doing that. Anyway, um, I'm going to wrap this up here. If I didn't get to your question, I want to apologize. As you can see, there were lots of questions. I did my best to get to as many as possible and tried not to talk too much. I tried, but you know, I guess I'm a talker. I guess that's why I do these shows. Uh, so I apologize if I didn't get to your question. As I've mentioned several times throughout the show, there's always the FAQ section over at EricTheCarGuy.com. I'm going to apologize for whatever this audio issue is, which I'm not sure. I mean, my connections and everything look good, but I'll, I'll look into that before the next show, which will be in two weeks. I will post the exact date down in the description. Uh, they're, they're on Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, once again, if you're watching this on YouTube, I apologize for not getting to those questions uh, because, well, I can't see them. So sorry about that. I'm also sorry if I butchered your names throughout the course of this show. It was not my intention to do so, but, you know, stuff happens. Once again, I apologize. And I think I've said I'm sorry like a bunch of times. I'm not going to do that anymore, but I will see you again in two weeks if you're uh, able. And you can find me on Google+, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram if you're wishing to connect with me socially. Close each of my videos, including these live shows. Be safe, have fun, stay dirty. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.